Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews of items, and convention panels, and other exciting things that we run into from time to time. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, assigned to Ragnarok Story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the 5th Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. I thought you were looking for the member which panel you're on so you don't talk about the wrong thing. Well, that, um, that would be helpful too. I've like done that before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks for reminding me. It's like we get to do one together every year. <laughs> okay, I'll be moderated because I am the business of art. That is my business, the business of art. Good. <laughs> so I can deal with this because I've been art agent as Hello. well. So I think that helps. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Works for me. No complaints. Put my two cents in, as usual. I like it. I like it. Sorry to continue me. I apologize. I don't have my name plate because I left it on the back. So then tell them your name. Liz Danforth. Yeah. There we go. This is Liz Danforth. Right. She's Maybe awesome. <laughs> All right. So what we should do is start at one end, introduce yourself, and part why what you do or like to do. All right. All right, my name is Janie Franz. I am an author. I've got 12 titles with Music Up Publishing. I'm also their acquisition editor and one of their content editors. I also do... Excuse me, but maybe we can close the doors. Yeah, because I'm hearing you there as well. Let's, yeah, let's do that. Echo off the back wall. Yeah. Uh, yeah just, I also do academic editing for... Uh, graduate students, um, and I also do business ghostwriting and a number of other things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Give them your name and... Oh, my name. Yes, I have one of those. Oh, I um, guess. <laughs> I have several, actually. Uh, I'm yes, Eric Schumacher today. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am an actor. I am a film producer and director. Uh, if you look at the back of the program guide, this is one of mine, Revenge oh. of Zoe, premiering here at 6.30 p.m. Yes. Thank you. Uh, with uh, some other wonderful producers. Um, I am best known for having being actually one of the only people on, on uh, one of the, one of just a small handful of people on earth to have played both Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday in nationally publicized productions. <laughs> Excellent, uh, and yes. Based on this film, I have also played a ninja and a mermaid. I'm the only one in the world. <laughs> <laughs> ever. Hey. In the history of humankind, or any other kind, yeah. I'm aware of. Um, and uh, so I've been performing as an actor basically since I was six years old. My parents raised me that way. Um, and, Lucky you. Uh, yeah, well, uh, they, they're, they, they really, uh, it was wonderful. They just shared their, their passion uh, for it with me, and I, I got the bug really early. And I uh, uh, started uh, directing and producing uh, at, a, at all, a relatively early age, but I won't say because then you'll know what my actual age is, which I don't say. Uh, I wouldn't worry think. about what you were going to say. Yeah, you're uh, you're <laughs> so Not so I, 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 I kind of, I, I, I work on all sides of uh, media and multimedia, and I'm also the uh, uh, current uh, president of a small production organization known as Sealy Studios. Okay. I'm Liz Danforth. I am best known for my art. I also do writing, editing, and game development. I go back to the second oldest role-playing game, Tunnels and Trolls, and um, that's where I first started hitting, uh, hitting my work as business, but uh, ended up working for everybody from Traveler and you know uh, all the Middle Earth uh, licensed work. Uh, computer game wise, I was responsible for the Rabid Dog and Wasteland One. <laughs> I wrote three months for uh, Wasteland Two, and they uh, ended up throwing out everything except my last name for the main character. <laughs> but um, I've I've been working off and on uh, steadily, but in different areas, and so a lot of people know me only as 
one thing or another. I, I literally, I was at uh, one, of, one of the guests up at Mile High Con a couple weeks ago, and uh, one of the guys said, oh yeah, I knew you was a writer before I ever knew you mm. did artwork. Mm. And this is typical. Yeah. Yeah. They'll know just one segment of me. Yeah. But generally, people know me as an artist. I did Magic the Gathering. I did... You know, I, I, I qualified for the you know, Academy of Gaming Arts and Design Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, um, Gamma's creative field back in 96. And beyond that, like you, I'm not going to be talking about my earliest stuff because you'll realize that I'm <clears throat> available for Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us already are. I think you're proud of it. Yeah. There's I'm glad I left that one. Uh, there's a little thing cooling on your turn. Your turn. Mm -hmm. we're done, we're done. No, because I'm lost. moderating. Oh, so okay. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm Jessica Feinberg. Uh, I've worked in a variety of different creative jobs. I did a lot of graphic design, uh, editing, and adapting for manga for Tokyo Pop, uh, which was a really strange job uh, that I fell into. But I primarily <laughs> do for my art and illustration, and now I do. Uh, crowdfunded my entire own series of illustrated and written books and then also uh, my own games and I've just been contracted for a couple of board games in addition to that for other companies so I kind of do a little bit of everything. Cool. Very good. I'd like to toss this here too now that we're bringing up games. I also do proofreading for Final Fantasy games okay. out of yeah. Minneapolis. So. And, and hopefully we won't, we won't make this an, an age thing too much but one of the reasons I became an artist were three articles in the first four or five issues of Duelist magazine, one of which was an interview with this marvelous lady. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. one, of, one, of my, one of my first panels, like five years ago at Tesco, we were on a panel together, I was like, oh my god, I'm not a panel. That's so cool. No, I'm not cool. That's fine. I like that this is such a diverse group of talents in many areas. I wasn't sure what they were going to do, put artists or who they were going to put. So I think this is fascinating because. Although we're doing different things, my drawing teacher used to say, we're all the same, but we're different. He's referring yes. to anatomy, but that's the whole point. The creative process is in all of us and trying to book society at the same time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, now I've been putting covers on books for 38 years, but I'm not of my age either, but I don't care. You know, <laughs> what does it matter? You have to be proud of what you do, you know, a long, long time. So I go back to no computers, no screens, no technology, no, none of that stuff. You, you got a brush, you got a pencil, <laughs> that's what you do, you know. You give a sketch, you know, you paint a painting, you know, big, whatever. Um, anyway, so I've been getting covers on books, and also I was an art agent, and my big client, who unfortunately recently, very recently passed away, Walter Velez, who did all the These World books, and the Myth books for Robert Aspern, and all of that, uh, he was my friend, my mentor, my, his family's my family, you know, and the man was amazing, but he didn't do what a lot of people do to get known. He didn't go to conventions, nobody met him, nobody knew him, he didn't get the accolades, the awards, but they all knew the books, they all know the books. It's now that he's passed away, they want you to buy these paintings, you know, and they're available. Uh, thousands of pieces of Thousands everywhere, wherever he went. The man was skilled, skilled in many ways. And so, and I know the people that I rep along the way. So I learned the business of art. And that is the point. You do what you do, you, you're learning skills, you have a, a thing you love. How do you get it out there? How do you get into that? You know, they're talking about today's current economic environment. It's always been a bad economic environment for artists. Hello. Do that. I mean, actors, musicians, dancers, all of the arts, writers. Look what you're competing with all these people who make words. I, I think it's because there's yeah. a weird stigma yeah. about creative folks that people feel like they can ask them for things that they would never ask another type that's of business and, um, and I don't you remember that's I didn't do that to a doctor or a lawyer but well I don't like, remember who did it but there was a video on the internet in the last couple of years of a guy who went around and took the exact things he's been asked as an artist and tried it on other businesses <laughs> so like can I have this t-shirt for free I'll promote your store uh, can I pay you for coffee next time if right. I tell people it's right. really good so. like like can I get the first one and just things that all of the businesses were saying well no you have to buy your groceries and it's like a lot of the creative yeah. stuff, I think, because there are people yeah. who 
for their own reasons, do it more as a hobby. I mean, that's yeah, your option. Yeah. But when you're running a business and you have to pay right. a mortgage and things, it's right. a little hard that Absolutely. there is yeah, kind of a rent. stigma that Absolutely. creative people don't really need to be paid. Right. And it's always so like, like, or right you away. Know, out of our class. Right. You know, yeah. that, right. Well, you can just make another one. That doesn't work. You just yeah. have fun and doodle all day. Exactly. <laughs> right. The other part of 19 that 19 months is, yeah. on this film. Wow. The other part of that is they, they think, oh, you've got books. You've got 12 titles. Yeah. You must be yeah. you rich. Know, as rich as exactly. Jane exactly. Gold. Exactly. <laughs> no. exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, we're all in, you know, yeah. small presses. Some of us are lucky enough to get signed with a uh, uh, big right. you know, uh, publisher, but it's like yeah. you have to hustle, even with them. I always have did. Always did. The difference was before, uh, because I, I live in New York, so I had all the New York, I worked every New York publisher except one. Um, You're from New York? I never would have known. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I hide it well. <laughs> I lost my Brooklyn accent years ago. So was I, but I only have I'm three in Queens words now. with the accent. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, you knew that. But I had the advantage, great clever, I had the advantage of being 25 minutes away from any publisher I wanted to see and to see them in person where you sat down with the portfolio in person not sending it in the ether through email that they may or may not open and you get feedback on the spot you know that that is that's so huge. that's huge it's so important and I know them all I mean I work with Don Walheim he wasn't easy to work with you know and Betsy's my friend his daughter and and he was just knew the market better than anybody I've been doing fantasy and science fiction magazine I've done I just did finish the novel it'll be up January February edition um, uh, early 80s. I did, I did 28 covers, I think, over the years. Because wow. I used to do it twice a year, and I used to get two a year. And now they're down, because of the economy, to six a year, bi monthly. And that's a shame because the writing, the authors, yes. and Gordon Van Gelder, who's the publisher and editor, is wonderful. I've known him for years. He was at St. Martin's, and I did all my Sherlock Holmes stuff with him. And uh, the market's changing and dying off because I live in Queens, and I'll tell you now, Queens and the Bronx do not have one bookstore. Not one bookstore. Like, we're never gonna read a book. I love authors. I mean, why can't you have both? I don't get it. Amazon's coming in now into Queens, into Long Island City, and building a headquarters in Queens. And I hear they're building a warehouse here. Yeah. So I think that comes down to a very relevant key yes. factor in exactly. uh, being able to monetize and, yes. and continue to monetize is that, like any other business, you have to adapt to changing exactly. circumstances right. and try to get ahead of the curve as much as exactly. possible. Um, you have to really, you know, as the publishing industry has been particularly hard hit, very hard. and as we know, uh, our, our news media, for example, is in a extremely bad situation right now because the internet yep. and it's very hard to actually you know you can't keep a bunch of investigative reporters right. flying across the world doing dangerous stuff and pay them to do that right. when you aren't getting you know money for every issue you now have to find ways to, to and so that that adaption that that adaptation period led to a very big shift in the way the media was disseminated and, and how much money was coming in for it and it's also led to us getting uh, much worse reporting as a result. Yeah. Um, and so it is with every other part of the industry, um, film, music, books, everything. Um, the, the, you know, it's not like you're going to sell all your books in a bookstore anymore. It's right. not like right. your movies are going to be, I mean theaters, are, uh, smaller theaters have been closing across the country, across the world. Um, right. and, and like everything else, it's right. all gone online, but the monetization scheme is much, much smaller yes. per view. Much, much, much smaller <laughs> per view. So I actually, I, I actually heard from. Uh, <clears throat> I was in a producers meeting with a director I've been working with, uh, who's a good friend who's in Italy. We're having, you know, like online calls. So that is a bonus um, that I can work with people across the world like, like that. But um, uh, and he was talking about a friend of his who spent two, three hundred thousand dollars on a film, sold it to next Netflix for fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, right? You can pay your rent on that one. Yeah. I think that brings us up to, you know, what do you do to, you know, put your brand out there yep. that you're, to do marketing? And as I was visiting with him earlier, um, I 
went ahead and a few years ago polled the top sellers in my publishing house. Twelve of them. I said, what did you do to become such a big seller? Hmm. And I got 12 emails back with 12 different things that they did, really? each one swearing them. This is the only way to do it. <laughs> I was at a recent convention, same thing. This is the only way to do it. And I was on this panel and I said, it's the only way for you. What you have to find out is who your audience is and what works for you. And it may be a multitude of things that you have to do, uh, but in this uh, saturated market, both art and, and writing and, and film and that sort of thing, you have to make sure that people know you're out there. And that's the hard thing, is how do you kind of stick your head up above the crowd? And that's, again, a personal thing. And I'm not sure how any of us could even say, okay, this is what you should do, right. because I don't know your life and I don't know what you're into and what would work. I actually, I, I do have a recommendation for that, and this is gonna sound very strange. And it, it actually kind of, it is what you should do, but it applies more to what you said that's different for every person. What you do is, if you are creating, whatever industry you're in, you allot one business day a month to just research. Uh, and that's, for me, I'm researching, are there new social media? Is there new PR? Uh, are there new printers? Are there new products I can put my work on? But, you know, what's the trends? And then also you have to ask yourself, what are you comfortable with? My general rule of thumb is if it is PR or a product or something that you would not appreciate getting yourself, don't put your work on it. Yeah. Uh, if you feel like you're being spammed, don't do that back to other people because they used to say there's no such thing as bad PR, and then social media came along, and now there is. <laughs> so you don't don't do any kind of PR that you are not comfortable receiving yourself. It's definitely a, but yeah, you have because the the social media stuff changes so fast, and I'm not even current on it. And I like researched it like a month ago. <laughs> so uh, there, three people told me about new services they're using to promote books that I've never heard of today, and I'm like, whoa. What, what did I mean? It's also for me one of the one of the key things is be flexible yeah. because yeah. your life is going to get in the way. Um, my my career arc was doing really great until I became caregiver for my mom, yeah. stopped me dead. Yeah. At the same time, my twenty seven year relationship broke up, mm -hmm. and the game industry, which was my primary bread and butter, switched over to video games. All at the same time. Oh, great. Okay. And I spent about 10 years completely invisible. I was doing my best, but I was over-medicated. I look at the art, and it was terrible. I can look at the dates on it and go, shit. Yeah, I, 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 I was doing the best I could, but I couldn't do much. And what I did was bad. I lost clients right, left, and center. And I had to completely reinvent myself once I finally came up for air. And uh, came back into the convention circuit into, and I'm pretty much back where I'm, I'm close to back where I was before. But thank God, in my case, for the old school renaissance of gaming, mm -hmm. because my name now has cachet yeah. for having been old. Right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> no, no, it's true. Yes. Again, I have 38 years of knowing these people, so you know, I mean. Gordon Van Gelder called me to say, I, mm -hmm. are you available to do a cover? I didn't look for it. I mean, because he knew who I was. So that's also, I've been selling on eBay for 15 years, my prints, and small things, because they don't buy big things, but because I have a presence there, which if you start now, I don't know if it would be quite be the same. And people say, well, why aren't you at this side or that side? I stay in one place, because I can't be monitoring, well, there's a lot of work to this damn stuff. Exactly. I mean, all the copy I have to write and all the stuff right. I have to do all the time and the packing and the shipping and the this and the that and, and you know. And if we paid enough, we'd hire an assistant. Exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. but then if it, your assistant can't sign books for you and if they're personalized yeah. and then they send them right. to the wrong people and you're like, yeah. you're like yeah. no, I'm terribly for that to happen. But I, and I do um, crowdfunding with Kickstarter, so yeah. it's like people don't realize how much work that is. Yeah. But I will say, like, they talk about the bad economy. Well, which economy are you talking about? Because the wonderful thing about the internet and shipping lives, 
you can sell to all over the world. Yeah, well, that's it's, it. And, and you've got that long market. tail. And thing. one of yeah. yeah, one of the things I look for is the issue with that is, especially like with this book that just came out, this is a heavy book, 300 pages. So if you're shipping it internationally, it's expensive. It is. Very expensive. Someone is paying pretty much as much for shipping as it cost me to print the book. Now, like, printing the book is expensive. Yeah. So my thing that I always look for is what could I give people that doesn't add to the weight of the book? Uh, and I've noticed more publishers are embracing this. Uh, Ingram Spark now offers to let you, in, in any order of print books you do from them, add a personalized page just for that order. Oh. So you could do them for an event, That's you could do them for a project, it doesn't cost anything extra, you can just say this batch of books yeah. gets this. Yeah. Uh, and I do custom illustrations on my covers with okay. markers and pens, things yeah. like that, or small lightweight things because if you are going for an international market, shipping is a huge factor. Yeah, it's huge, 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 very expensive. I had to sell a print to somebody in Spain and it cost more than the price of the print. To get mm -hmm. It was like $34, or 30, sure. at the time, $32 print and she paid $34 for shipping. Well, I mean, it was a, it was big, a big yeah. 16 by 20 print, right. I mean, you know, but it's crazy stuff. Well, okay, so we have pros and cons to everything, and we try to work into these things. Yes, you have a world, a planet-wide audience. You can send, I've sent things through eBay to Japan, to Australia, to all over the place. Great, and if they're willing to pay the shipping, God bless you, you know. But you also have amazing competition. Everybody thinks they can put a book out now. Everybody yes. can make a book good, and the public doesn't know, unless your name's Stephen King or a big name, what this is and who is this. I mean, you go to conventions and they meet you personally. That's great. That's the best. I used to do eight, nine, ten conventions a year years ago. All over world fantasy, I always did, and all, you know, all the East Coast stuff, and whoever would make me a guest. You know, I would go. I even went to London for the World Fantasy. You know, I went everywhere. I went to Ottawa. I was all over the map. So I got myself out there. But now, how expensive is it to do this? I remember staying in a hotel that was $40 a room and sharing it with a friend. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> and it's cheap here. I actually, I actually have a really good recommendation yeah. for that that yeah. it took me time to figure out. But if you are spending any money for what you do, supplies, printing, right and you are traveling to conventions, get a Hyatt credit card because really? you will earn your points. Oh, okay. I never pay for hotel stays, it's okay. great. Yeah, like, or, or whatever your hotel is, but Hyatt has the best deal. Yeah. Uh, so if you do Kickstarters, pull in 20 yeah. grand and spend nine grand on shipping, that's about two nights at a hotel free if you put it through a Hyatt credit card. So that's okay. been like a huge... Okay, well that's interesting. There are things to do, but... The system. The, the, again, you have to work, and I think the term somebody said, reinventing yourself and always coming up with something <clears> new. I mean, the same thing in music, you know. The, those that are successful always... I remember when Simon and Garfunkel broke up. It was heartbreaking. I mean, yeah. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> but when Paul Simon was going to go on his own, yeah, until really? till Graceland yeah. came around, I couldn't. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a long time before your time, it's been young to know about this. I know about this. But then he comes up with a Graceland. But you see what he had to do. He had to reinvent himself, speaking do his music. own music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of music. Oh, the, the, the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a loud one. Yeah. Oh, I should no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You know what? I'm shutting my sound up right That's now. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody calls me anyway. Because, yeah. Anyway, but it's the same thing for writing and art. So you have the, to, you got the scales here, and, and they're going. Also, authors today are now, for the uh, e-books, the small press responsible for paying for their covers, for reprints. They come to me. I've had several come to me. Um, I'd like to, you know, reprint as an ebook, and I will pay you. Uh, what do you want? And we don't have any money, but well, that's not have money. <laughs> and where I was, you know, where is it? The Attack of the Giant Baby here. I got like two thousand dollars here in nineteen eighty one. Is it say nineteen eighty? Is I can't even see. I think it's nineteen eighty. Who's gonna pay me two thousand dollars today? You're lucky I get an ebook they offer you a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. No, that's, that's true. It's one thing if they're if they're a reprint and I've already done the work. Okay, I can't pay, you know I can't pay the rent, but I can get some food. But they're not gonna get that kind of money today, and that's the problem for whatever we do. And are our rents less? Is that food bill less? Is that gas less? No. Or your business expenses. Or your business expenses, everything that you do. So you have to balance financially. And I'm good with money. I'm really good. 
You know, I got a, I got a mantra. Do I want it or do I need it? Yes, exactly. You know, <laughs> I want it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but this, this is the whole thing. But I think you asked the question about when this, has it gone too far? You asked me before. There is this pendulum. Although we have not a single bookstore in Queens or in the Bronx, they're going to, why can't you have a children's bookstore? You'll make money with parents coming in. You have a birthday party room. They'll buy books for their kids. Have all sorts of fun promotions. You could do this. How do you set, how does, a child has to hold and touch a book. And children's books are a beautiful market. They're beautiful. The illustrations are great. They're one of the most beautiful markets for art. Mm -hmm. the children's books to appeal to children to buy books and then you take the bookstore away. <laughs> Excuse me. Barnes & Noble used to have a room in the back where right, the kids could so go in there and look at books and pick books. And sometimes you want to touch it and feel it. Absolutely. I can't buy clothing online. I want to touch it and feel it and try it on. I don't want... My daughter would say, well, I can buy more shoes. I can send them back. Yeah, now you got to left to the post. So it's going to repackage. you got to print out a label. you got to go there. you got to get rid of the thing and I got to find another one. Right. And I know um, San Francisco's actually been doing, and I, I'm friends with a couple of authors there, a lot to the actual city to invest in and preserve the independent bookstores that's, and keep them going. That, that's but I think I think it's a double-edged sword. It's like some of the bigger bookstore chains are going, but then I've heard from some people that independent bookstores are doing better in a lot of cities. Because they don't have the competition. Because what they're offering is not, I mean, a big corporate bookstore is offering something very similar to Amazon, but an independent bookstore is offering... What does the staff recommend? I mean, look at Bookman's does amazing here in Tucson because the staff recommends books, because there are events there, because the authors come in. And I think eventually when things balance out, hopefully we'll have more of yeah. a more beneficial yeah. independent bookstore market. Yeah, hopefully. I think that's very possible. I think it's the same in many other, uh, like same with, I believe that, that there'll be a resurgence to some degree of small independent exactly. theaters. Um, the I think that you know the, the the death of large bookstores was predictable. Yeah. Uh, they inflated prices, had way too big a footprint, spent yes. way too much money yes. on way too much space that was barely utilized. Exactly. And then the internet, uh, duh. So uh, you know I, I think that uh, that that leads though to again that getting ahead of the curve thing. And I think one of the most salient points I would make about any aspect of monetizing an arts career comes from, I, I said this to some, I, not to brag, but I said this to somebody who I was mentoring like three days before one of the top um, talent managers in the entire world posted some of this online, which was, if you're in the creative fields, you have to be creative about how you manage exactly. your career. Exactly. So what it comes down to is that, the, the, you know, if you, if you, whatever it is that you're doing, look at now at your business process creatively yeah. create create things that weren't there before create new pathways to develop fan base create new pathways to monetize fan base um, and you know certainly understand how business operates if you can that, that would be really useful if you intend to ever make any money at something but then get creative uh, figure out new 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 ways to get publicity um, you know uh, I'm reminded of some of the uh, the famous um, uh, schlock movie theaters in the uh, 1950s, 60s, and 70s who did all kinds of crazy publicity campaigns. Mm -hmm. and like, uh, I can't remember, the, the you, somebody here will probably remember but the, the name of the filmmaker who was famous for doing things like doing a horror movie and putting uh, like, uh, like, like things that would sort of pop out of the people's seats, yeah. Yeah. and that became a thing. People, had the buses yeah, the people came, yeah. exactly. People came yeah. to the movies because yeah. they wanted that experience. Yeah. Well, and, and I uh, think you'll see a change because there's starting to be this trend of like longer and longer movies. And I stopped going to the movie theater because physically it got uncomfortable to sit there. The seats weren't that comfortable. But now we have a trend, at least like here in Arizona, of theaters like Roadhouse coming in with really comfortable seats. They don't say cost more. And mm -hmm. I go to the movies probably at least once or twice a month now, mm -hmm. whereas prior to Roadhouse, I maybe went once or twice a year. Like, it's a huge difference for me. Like, the yeah. experience is changing. And you just have the lounge chairs that we have. The, yeah, all the way back to the back. They'll bring you food. I actually yeah. fell asleep during a movie. <laughs> 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 so, that's the best though. part, though. If your significant other drags you to a movie you don't want to see, it's fine. You've got a really comfortable place to take exactly. a nap. You've got snacks. You're good. Exactly. You, know. you have to bear in mind, though, that, that, and, you know, that, that the majority of, so in the movie biz, I, I notice a really funny thing. Even filmmaker friends of mine will ask other filmmaker friends, what movies have you seen recently? And they all talk about major releases. Yeah. 
when they talk about smaller releases, indie films, they have even they have not made the flip in their minds to consider that a real movie. Oh, so that's a shame. And it's the same with authors and it's the same with artists. Unless you have distinguished yourself somehow in a in a larger way, yeah. they don't think you're real. And that's in part as we just stated, because there are also a lot of people who have no training, no experience, no you know, and Still. just start doing stuff and it's great. I mean, express your art, please God express your art. But that being said, you know, for those who have really put everything they have into an arts career and have, and have put it all out there and worked really hard to develop it, that's your competition. And, and you know, and people only have so much time, so much money. They're not going to just spend money on a book because you wrote one, they don't know who you are. So you've got to find a way to distinguish yourself in a marketplace versus, I mean, you know, if I'm making a sci fi film, my competition is freaking Marvel. <laughs> How do you deal with that? What you, the way you deal with that is by slowly, carefully over time building a fan base that is aware of your stuff and really likes your stuff. And that means, and here's the big polar shift for a lot of artists, is that when I'm making a movie, I'm not just considering what I want to make. I'm also considering what my, my audience would like to see. I'm making it, you know, it's, it's not just a cathartic artist, artistic experience for me, but it's a gift to my audience, and I look at it that way, is that I'm trying to make something that I hope will be beneficial in some way yeah. for others. And uh, um, and then, of course, if you're able to develop enough uh, interest in following, other people tend to sometimes hire you to do stuff mm -hmm. as well. And uh, so that's that's extremely important, but it's, yeah. it's critical to think that way. It's also critical to think um, about microtransactions, I believe, uh, in that, uh, as an artist, I, I, I made this statement to several filmmakers a while ago. Um, from a, from a, an artistic perspective, your piece of art is a, a beautiful artistic expression that can bring great emotional goodness to other people or something. You know, it can do something good for people. From a marketing perspective, it's a commercial for a product. It's an asset. It's exactly. So a movie is a commercial for everything I can sell about the movie. A book is a commercial for the actual physical book or the electronic book or maybe a poster of the cover or whatever else you can possibly sell for it. So if people are emotionally invested, emotionally involved in you and your work, then for their own reasons, not because, not just because of you, then then they, then there's a variety of different ways that they that you might be able to monetize by delivering something that they see as valuable, and that's the real key. And that's one of the things that I've seen as I started my Patreon a year and a half ago because I had applied to Gen Con, where I'd been going for umpty squillion years and was finally getting back to the point where I was going again. And they had a juried art show, and they did not choose to invite me. And I happened to have, no, oh yeah. my God. Um, and I happened to have my Facebook open that day, and I said, oh, Gen Con didn't want me. And uh -oh. the internet exploded. <laughs> it was very, very gratifying, but it, it, it set off the light bulb in my head because I'd been thinking about Patreon. But I was going, yeah, I'm an old has-been. I'm washed up. Nobody will come. And I looked at this, and I said, I'm starting my Patreon this week. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. Mine's a year, and I, yeah. it's, it's why I can do a 300-page book instead of a 100-page exactly. book because I'm getting paid every month. Yeah. And um, uh, But um, one of the things, pursuant to what you were just saying, is I'm trying really hard with Patreon not to work for them, but to work with them. And that's something of a different mindset that I had in the past, where it's like, it's not that, it's not that I'm letting the inmates run the asylum, because ultimately, if I'm not happy doing what I'm doing, my basic Patreon is, help me do the stuff I want to do, okay? But I want it to be something they want as well. And trying to listen and listen and listen. Tell me what you are interested in. Tell me what pleases you. Tell me what doesn't. You know, um, I did a, the, I, I made use of it in October and said, everybody at this level or who jumps up to this level will get one of the pieces that I'm doing in, in, in October. And I'm going to be freaking experimental. Some of the stuff came out really awful. <laughs> but... You know, those who had paid the most over time yeah. got first pick, right. and then I worked my way down. Okay, what you're doing is very important because the internet is very impersonal in many ways, um, and there's so much a glut of available art and all sorts of things and things, you know, things to do and buy on the internet. Um, 
you're making it very personal by doing this because when you come to conventions, you know, you meet people and, and they like meeting the artist or the writer. I met so and so, and I remember one of my first early conventions. Stephen King was there, and Peter Straub, and all these people, and David Morrell. I got to be friends with them because of this. But we all became fans of the work and all the people that came because you can talk to them and be with them. Oh yeah, I was sat there with Stephen King or whoever it was, you know, and you, they get to meet you, but because it's so expensive to do a lot of conventions and all of this other stuff and for people to attend them as well and then have money to still buy your stuff. Their stuff yeah. It's so nice to have an audience that feels they can personally get to know you and you're listening to them. I think we've lost a lot of that in all this well, stuff. I think it's really important yeah. to decide as a creator, what's your goal? Yeah. Yes. Uh, is your goal to be famous? Is your goal to, I mean, my, my first goal when I really started doing Kickstarter and all that was I wanted to put out 50 books by the time I'm 50 and I'm more than halfway there, so I'm really happy about yeah. that. <laughs> but um, I occasionally when I'm doing, especially if I'm doing a game Kickstarter, I get emails from people who say, why are you not doing this? And usually they're comparing me to a company that is raising somewhere between forty and a hundred thousand dollars, and I said, "But this company spends a third half their time. They do one game a year, and everything else is working with retail. Everything else is working with conventions. And for me, my passion is doing the writing, doing the art. So I want to minimize the business side, the clerical side, the pain in the butt side for me. Um, thanks. Some people go, "How are you? I do like three books a year. You're nuts." I'm like, "But that's what I love doing." Um, so for me, like Patreon, I've had a very similar experience. It's a way, my choice was, I'd rather have a smaller number of fans on right. Patreon, have 300 or less people on Kickstarter, but I make more per copy of what I'm doing, because I'm doing it directly, and I get to work with them. I get photos from them, um, and I think it's very important if you're doing something like Patreon, when you're asking people what they want, you have to set limits. Oh, yes. like, here's our theme for the month. Pick within this. What's your favorite <laughs> animal? Yeah. But the best part is that if you're an artist who is doing paintings, you will sell more of your paintings to the people who help suggest what you paint. There's about a, So I not only get a certain amount per month, but I sell two-thirds to half. This we sold almost all, but I think we sold all but 24 paintings out of the 300-page book before the Kickstarter because of Patreon. Uh, which is amazing. When I just did, uh, I did uh, uh, Steve Jackson Games got the uh, fantasy trip back, and I did a ton of illustrations and all, uh, like 157 illustrations and counters. And he posted in the uh, after after the uh, Kickstarter was complete, which was a three hundred thousand dollar Kickstarter. Uh, all of those people uh, were told. The staff forth is willing to sell the originals, huh. and my email went. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, and nice. I made twice as much right. in selling those originals yeah. as Steve paid me to do them in the first place. Yeah, really well, cool. one of the most popular PR experiences I had was completely accidental. <laughs> <laughs> I did an Ice Dragons book, and one of my fans commented on Facebook when it came out, "Are you going to do Desert Dragons?" And they spelled it wrong and said Desert Dragons. Yes! So I'm a snarky. <laughs> ridiculous person so I responded very seriously with yes there will be a candy cane worm there will be a chocolate fudge <laughs> dragon where do I get that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no it's for sale at my book my serious? Facebook yeah. exploded and that book was one of the most popular Kickstarters I did it was way better than Ice Dragons That's and I was like where do you get inspired from Pay attention to typos on social media. Yeah. Because, <laughs> but that's but there is, cool. like, I love that interaction with fans. And I think, you know, there's two sides of the technology. You can have an experience where you're more separated because you, if you're not at conventions, you don't get that. Or you can try to tailor it where you're using Patreon, using Kickstarter. You are doing more of the clerical work yourself, which is a pain. Uh, shipping sucks. <laughs> yeah. But having that, yeah. that relationship with the fans is, like, I wouldn't trade that well, for that, Well, that's the, the thing is you need to get more personal today because... <laughs> It just means more to them, and of course, you know, um, you, you'll do better. They'll be happier, and you'll get, and they'll recommend things. That's really important. There's there's an interesting thing there too. The nature of celebrity has changed, as you yeah. may all notice, yeah. dramatically yeah. with the with the with the advent and, and deeper touch of social media. And uh, I mean, you know, when I was a kid, it was you know. It, it, an, an actor who was in a big movie was untouchable, but, and yeah. there's so few of those, right? I mean, you're not you're not likely to, you know, invite Tom Cruise to lunch or something. <laughs> but uh, but there's 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 really now an expectation that there's a greater level of personal interaction and personal knowledge of you as a creator, as an artist, um, and 
regardless of your level of, of fame, you know, unless you're absolute A-list, in which case there's still that expectation of you know not being able to touch that person. And I don't think that's going to last very long. In fact, there you know the recent research has started to show uh, some reports in Hollywood Reporter and so on that, that celebrity isn't selling films the way it used to either. Um, so I think that's a beautiful thing because it allows one to, it, 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 for an artist, it takes the pressure off to be to try to pretend you're some deity-like creature or something yeah. you're not, um, you know, and and it and, and it also gives you this opportunity to have a much more personal and sometimes even very in-depth relationship with people who would consider themselves your fans, quote unquote. Uh, I don't even like the word fan very much. Yeah. It's like I, I you know, I, I like supporters or you know, something like that. I, I use the term because everybody, yeah, exactly that. And that's another thing. The, the whole patron, uh, you know, uh, uh, concept has come back in, in a beautiful way, where it's where you can be supported by a crowd. Um, but the other side of that is, of course, that because it's necessary then to have that level of personal interaction, you do have to remember that you're on almost all the time emotionally. Right. And, uh, and that you have an obligation to the people who are looking to you for a product and maybe, you know, maybe in some cases, maybe even looking up to you a little bit. Um, and, uh, and it's a tremendous amount of work to make sure that you are just touching base, I mean, and, and doing it well. Not doing damage in the process. Yeah, if you don't know etiquette for whatever the social media is you're using, if it's new or you're not experienced, definitely see if there's some articles on email etiquette, on Facebook etiquette, so that you're not offending people out there with what you're doing. I mean, I love nothing more than, well, some things more, but very few things more than, than you know, somebody coming to me and telling me they like my work and having a dialogue about that. I love that. And I, love, and I make a lot of friends that way, like really good friends. But, you know, now, now, you know, I have 70,000 Facebook followers, and I go to events, wow. and that's just Facebook. Wow. And I go to events, and and people will say, hey, it's me! And they go, hi, it's me too. I'm so great because we have guests. Oh, yes, of course, I know that, but I don't remember who you are because I just had a conversation with 30,000 people. As another aside to this thing is, you know, there are, are places out there that will tell you there are all these wonderful things you can do for nonfiction. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, you can speak to this group and you can go and present because of this organization, if your book is about some disease or something that you've got uh, and overcome or whatever. But when you're selling entertainment, which is what we are all doing, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to figure out. You can't go and speak to the Elks about entertainment. <laughs> read my books, read my fantasy, read my, you know, archaeology book. Read, you know, they don't want that. But there are places where you can do that other than conventions. Yes. Where that, you know, you're speaking to groups about the process of writing or celebrity or whatever it is what what is it like to be you and I think that's something that it's an avenue I haven't explored but I think I would like to explore where I live um, and and then extend that but I think the real key that that you've been mentioning over and over here is and it's what I discovered some time ago is you have to go where the fans are you have to go where your market is. Yes. People who will read your stuff or yes. look at your paintings or buy whatever um, or see your films. You gotta go where that is. Yeah. And if we could do more one-on-one, uh, -on -one, mm -hmm. you know, or one to 1,500 people or whatever it is at a convention where they know, here's a face, I've seen you before, you're, you're that writer, whoever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> even that I'll take, you know, really, I will. As long as I say, well, I, I know you from someplace. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's really, really important. Um, there's another thing I did that inadvertently didn't realize. We do things we don't realize sometimes what the, the repercussions or lack of for that. I was doing painting and presenting stuff, and I was doing a lot of. I did a lot of science fiction. I didn't realize until I was pulling out paintings from my closet <clears throat> how much I did and going through the books because. In the late 70s, early 80s, there was a lot of science fiction writing, great writers, 
great writers. I met Ted Sturgeon. I met, you know, Asimov used to come to the conventions. I met all these people, you know, Lynn Carter's house. He lived in Queens. It was right there. <laughs> when, you know, Uncle Lynn, you know, Crazy Lynn. But, you know, so I knew all these people. And so, you know, that's the whole, they got the fans coming to them and we went to them. It was like that. You do have to do that. But I didn't realize that when after I did that, I really got into the horror market. And then I got into the mystery market. I was, I did children's books up all over the map. So as you know, in gaming, great to do gaming art, but you know how many folded, how many disappeared over the years. Iron Crown Enterprises, Walter used to do stuff, tons of TSR stuff, tons of all sorts of small companies that just started and disappeared. And so to be more diverse in many ways, where you're going, and it doesn't mean you're not true to what you love the most, but there are, there are other places that you can open some doors so you're not stuck. The two biggest markets in publishing have always been romance and mystery. Right. They will reprint Sherlock Holmes book, Agatha Christie books, and put new covers in. You know, I did you know, the Cat Who books, you know, these crazy Cat Who books. What did I do? 26 of them? I don't know what it was. Oh my goodness. For 10 years, I did those books. Sweet. I was telling them before. I got paid for the hardcover book for this about $2,000 a cover. What am I doing? Mystery? Because it's for, it was for Putnam, right? The hardcover. Right. Big companies. Okay, I'm in New York. I can do that. I'm doing clues, mystery things, you know, and cat paw prints. They were big paintings on canvas. And, <laughs> you know, not to be bored, the paw prints are going up on this one, and they're going down on this one. <laughs> Every other book, if you were to put them together, going up <laughs> like this, just so I wouldn't be bored. And then they would do soft book, paper book, act books. I, you get paid half of, I covers first rights. This is second rights. I got half of that. Then audio books did audio dub audio did audio cassettes. I got paid again, and then Thorndike Press did large print books. I got paid again. It was the sweetest deal for ten years. Do you get that anymore? Because now when they buy your art, it's all rights. Yes. It's all right. So you get cut right there. They're buying world rights. They're buying everything unless you, you know, if you're a pain in the ass about it. Goodbye. You go. Yeah. Because they think they rule. So it was a different time. But if you find some other places you wouldn't expect to go like when you didn't expect the dessert thing to happen <laughs> that was great. but you know what something like that is so much fun I didn't see the art but if the art is really different and fun you can make prints and sell prints you got product that's the well and thing I, I think a big thing too yeah. online is it's not just sales if yeah. you're on patreon or you're on Kickstarter or you're previewing movies you get a level of feedback that is yeah. much more detailed. And honestly, with Patreon, people basically pay you to give you feedback. That's amazing. <laughs> so I know these are people who care a lot because they're paying me every month, even just a couple bucks. And I will know which prints I should get extra of for conventions or my online store, things like that. So you're not investing your own money right. in things that used to be very <laughs> expensive. Yes, Because if you're yeah. doing, well, how many years at 75? 175. 175 yeah. pictures. You can't bring 10, 10 15 prints of each of those to oh, well. physically to a convention that doesn't right. work. Yeah. Right. And if 10 of them sell and the others don't, then where do you store those? Where do you, so there's a lot of the feedback. Right. Right. And then the, the one thing I've noticed that is actually one hard fast rule for PR that works for whatever type of creating you're doing. You will always get a better PR reaction, whether it's in person or online, if you show your process. Yes. I can post finished paintings. I will never get as many likes on finished paintings or finished things as, I don't mean, if you're a writer, you take have your draft printed out or you have a laptop and a cup of coffee and it's where I will get way more likes if I crop it in and show just the painting. I don't get as many likes as if I zoom out and you see my messy palette and my cup of coffee. People yeah. love the demystifying. Right. They think you just magically poof and your cover right. for the book appears. Yeah. Yeah. But if you show, <laughs> you know, if you show behind the scenes photos from, I mean that's huge now. Most movies now yeah. are showing set photos. They're showing makeup photos, things yeah. like they never used to do. This that is true. Much. However, I will say in the film industry, you have to be very strategic about that. Um, example: uh, There was a film, I can't remember the name of it, but it was based on a big, huge novel series that came out a while back. And the very first publicity campaign that they went with was showing behind the scenes stuff. They didn't show anything, any trailers, anything else about the movie. First they showed behind the scenes stuff, unfinished sets, looked like crap, the movie tanked. Because the first impression that people got was, this will suck. You've yeah. destroyed the property I love. 
it, it recovered because the books were so big, but the film itself did not do well. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's why, because it was a good film. Um, so I think it's important to be, you know, uh, in film we hire set photographers to take photos and then we go through them. And I try, if I, if I have control, which I don't always, but if I have control, then I, I will say <laughs> that never sees the light of day. Exactly. But that does, because at least it, you know, it, because there are things that, you know, film sets are often very, especially indie film sets, are often very messy places <laughs> and, and very, uh, you know, it's not at all glamorous to make the film, really. Uh, it's just the promotions afterwards that work that way. Well, so. I, think, I think both of those things, though, speak to that same personalization. Yeah, very true. Very true. Yeah, that it's, yeah. it's, you know, you're right. You don't just poop it out. You know, and, and I had an interesting discussion with one of my supporters because I said, when I first started, I, I noticed I had a series in my blog when I was blogging um, of uh, pictures have stories. And I would tell the story behind the picture, things that were about it, what I was thinking about, what the Easter eggs in the drawing might be, and things like that. And those always got way more interest. And I said, I felt really awkward because I felt like I was a magician showing you how I did my tricks. And he said, no, because a stage magician is the art of deception. What you're showing is the art of creation. Mm -hmm. Ah, very good. And I was awesome. like, ding. <laughs> very good. But anything that shows someone how much work you put in, yeah. because I think you're much, people are much more to spend money if they realize how much work it is. And there is, like, in that, like, stigma mythology of, like, we just meditate in the moonlight and bam, yeah, this beautiful finished <laughs> product appears. And there wasn't editing, there wasn't <laughs> sketches and revisions. No, and, you know, I think anything that shows your, your process, process as a creator, even if you're just talking about it, um, it makes it more personal, but it also shows the, the level of work. And I know it's like if you go to buy a piece of furniture, if you know that that was handcrafted and that somebody spent hours carving it, you are willing to pay more for it. You understand yeah. the value, and I think that that... And, and I think the other side of that as well is that there's a certain educational value to yes. it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you see, when you see well-constructed behind-the-scenes stuff on films, when you see the artist's process, you learn things, and that's a value. That's, it is. You know, that, 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 well, then they'll come and question you, too, yeah. for making another contact, yeah. Yeah. because, mm -hmm. you know, right. how much getting that feedback, which you wouldn't get... It, and it goes to the key anyway. of both delivering value and perceived value exactly. to your audience. Exactly. You want to give. You want to give all the time. Give, give, okay. give. That's that's really. Important. And they need to come up, which all of us do. I think that's how we all sort of are successful. Is there certain things that always sell? There's certain things. You know, everyone has their own idea of dragons, and you know, if you do something that's really different or a creature that you do something different with it in some way in your own way you will most likely get bias for that thing so you know in harder times every once in a while I'll go through that so recently I've been in the dodo bird uh, fixation <laughs> dodo bird sell because I'm a big Alice in Wonderland fan I, I had hundreds of old and reprints of Alice books which I'm in the process of getting rid of the collection I'm selling them on eBay well but that dodo bird, it's the damn dodo bird that people love it, you know, and I did a lot of research about them and all this other stuff and I find when I do a drawing and I'm doing it on like a charcoal paper, like a gray or something, and I'm doing it in the Prisma pencil but adding the white highlights, they will buy every single yep. one yeah. of them. No, you know, and, I'm doing and it doesn't policy. matter if yeah. a painting took a hundred no. times more effort. Right. It's yeah, a drawing. It's, yeah. What you love yeah. the most or put the most work into. Well, I mean, yeah. You know, people feel this. They feel when somebody's heart is in it. They, they, there's, there's something intangible about this, but it's, it's something that people say. If it speaks to you. It speaks to you. And Alice in Wonderland fans are nuts. They, are, they will buy anything Alice. And you, and part of the Alice group over on Facebook there. Oh my God, the things they bought, they show that they bought, that they did, no matter what you do with Alice. So there's these sort of traditional Poe, another thing, Lovecraft and Poe. And no matter what I will do, I'll rave, I can do Ravens from now to tomorrow every which way. I mean, they'll just love the Poe themes as I do, you know, so I, I love it and they sense that. So there's certain uh, writings that you can go back to. And even I think, I don't know, in writings, if there are things that, can allude to these things in some way in that time, that period. People love certain things and we have to grab that too. You, and it is old but new. You're making it new, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's really interesting. So you find these funny little quirky things 
And I want to see these dessert. <laughs> that's so intriguing. I was so hungry because, you know, if you've painted hundreds of dragons, yeah. you don't need ref reference for the dragons. I needed right. reference for the desserts. <laughs> so I, I'm wondering, oh, why are you so hungry? I just spent five hours staring at a picture of photos of strawberry shortcake while right. I'm drawing this. Oh, that's good. That's good no, for I'm you. I'm so hungry. Now I'm proficient at strawberry shortcake. You can do strawberry shortcake do creatures, a whole book, world right? of them. You know? But one thing does lead to another, and you never know where it comes. Like you said, someone can ask you to do something of it. They like something, and something you may never have done. An animal, I love painting animals. I do lots of just plain old animal things. And boy, they love penguins. They like puffins, penguins. I once wanted to do an ugly animal calendar, you know, aardvarks and, <laughs> yeah. and, and moles, you know, that star face moles and these unusual animals, you know, because they're so weird looking and eye eyes and they're all these crazy, I love painting animals. And every drawing that I'll do, and I do a nice finished drawing, and I sell it with a mat. Finish is very important. It's in a mat, in my lock sleeve. And they get a product that is clean and neat and wonderful. And it's standard size. It's a 11 by 14 mat. You know, they can go to Michael's and pick out a frame when it's on sale and get the coupons. You know, so you have to, these are things that you do. And by matting prints, yeah, it's far more work. I have to buy the backing board. I have the mats cut. For me, I have a place that cuts these mats. Great, it's great prices too. And then you know all this other stuff that you spend money on. You know the mylar, a great place for mylar. And uh, there's packing tape you go through when you're oh mailing the packing tape. I use that Scotch heavy duty stuff. So much better. Go to Home Depot. Don't go to <laughs> Staples for it because it's so much cheaper. Or go to Lowe's, especially if your boyfriend works there. Yeah. Ten percent. Well, but, right. <laughs> go to Staples. But these are the things, little things that become really important. And you're known for in some way because you've made it so your own. You have to personalize what you do for you, attaching, and then they pick up on it. So it's but I, I think if you don't treat your work well, you can't yeah. expect your fans to treat it well. So right. I'm always shocked. We do a lot of comic cons, but we do we don't do the mats, but we always do backing boards and bags for ours. Uh, backing boards. Most are people important. do bags. Yeah. I'm always shocked when I see people walk here and they've, they've spent. Twenty to thirty dollars on a print from an artist, they didn't even put it in a bag. Yeah, you can't spend wow. fifteen cents to get a piece of plastic yeah. to protect your. Like that's yeah. that's not yeah. respectful to your fans who are buying your work. Then and yeah. it's like it's like if you were selling your movies on like burned DVDs with handwritten labels and. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> the case. Well, you in the case. Where did the DVD? Just fold it. First yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is totally a legit copy. Or like, or like, or like you just skip the book cover and it's just a plain white dust. Like you don't need a cover on your book, right, guys? It's so <laughs> odd. Yeah. But yeah, no, but presentation is important. You're right. I, I do sell unmatted prints in backing board and the mylar, but the price is much less. So yes. I'm charging a little bit more for that mat, but technically I'm making some money on the mat because I'm buying them in bulk. Um, yeah. If you buy, I think it's, there's a price range, 1 to 20, it's this price, 20 to 40, it's this price. But if you buy the, you know, just don't buy four, you buy the 20, you know, if you want buy 14 mats. And so, you know, it becomes a storage problem. My house yeah, looks like yes. a warehouse, you know, especially yeah. now. So, and years and years ago, just a little aside, I decided that, 30, going back 38 years, um, that I'm not selling my original paintings. I don't sell prints, you know, because that's my retirement. <laughs> well, guess what? This is now my retirement. Nobody will buy the art. Because oh. I got the money, oh. the friggin' money. They don't have the money, though know, I got these hundreds and hundreds of paintings. So, you know, one whole room, the lot, what would have been the large bedroom is a storage room. <laughs> this is what happens. So uh, now, I've gotten really lucky in the respect in that what I offer is like, hey, if you're Kickstarter funding and you go up higher, you get closer to the Here's where you get the original with the book and it's from the book, so you're buying them. Together. Yeah, but I'm, I, I used to paint paintings. This, this, because it's a giant baby, it's a three foot painting. <laughs> it's a three foot painting. You can't give that one away. I gave it to my daughter when my grandson was one. <laughs> That's a better place for it. It's on the wall. But the paint, I used to paint really big, you know. So now I'm coming down on board, hard board, and uh, I paint on canvas. So it's hard for me to give that away because this is a lot of stuff. Well, I charge them more. Like you're, you gotta charge you're them hundreds more. of dollars more than yeah. just the book. But yeah. I find it's easier to get someone to buy the original if they're getting oh, yeah. the book that it's in. Yeah. Let's go, but how's that time? We're just about I think we're out of time. We are out of time. Yeah, I hear people rumbling out there. <laughs>
Thank you. I think thank this was great. Yeah. 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 Uh, at uh, 2 o'clock, uh, look in your uh, schedule. I'm, I'm doing a, a one person class on how to get started as an actor. So, if you're oh, relevant right. to this, if anyone has yeah. interest in that. And um, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I'm doing an art and hardship. And if anybody, like if Liz, if you'd like to come be on the panel, they put me on this alone. And I was like, oh, I, I think you were giving a talk. <laughs> I, have, I have notes, but I, I think it depends on who's in it. But I think it's, I really think it's important to talk about how. You turn that around and use it as fuel, and how it doesn't right. stop being dark. Like your sauce. Yeah. Yeah. What's on your water? Oh, get the, this is the oh, most yeah. popular thing I've ever painted. By the way, it's 15 minutes, so we yeah. ignore all the ones I put 12 to 16 hours in in watercolor, and I do this little guy and put make good art and. <laughs> yeah, the Neil, yeah, Neil Gaiman thing. I'm, that's yeah. literally on my bathroom wall. I've got to make good art. So, so yeah. thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank, thank you, you people for participating. This afternoon, um, somewhere I think it's in Mason. Uh, I'm doing a pitch session for uh, Music Up Publishing. If you have a one to ten minute elevator speech about your book, first line through your yeah. book, I'll listen. Is that open to everyone? It's open to Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening.